Thanks, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging that we're on Gadigal land um, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, um, emerging in particular because of the nature of this panel. Um, I'd like to start by introducing our amazing panellists. Um, Aisha Akanabi is a fashion stylist, writer, social commentator and artist based in London with a keen interest in socio-political issues, music, culture and a unique ability to establish a political, psychological and artistic understanding of style. Her recent video, The Problem with Wokeness, caused a viral, sen viral sensation. She's a firm believer that personal style is something that is accessible to everyone. <laughs> Aya Shebi is an award-winning pan-African feminist. She is the first African Union youth envoy and the youngest diplomat to the African Union Commission Chairperson's Cabinet. She is the founder of multiple platforms such as the Youth Programme of Holistic Empowerment Mentoring, coaching the next generation of positive agents. This goes on for quite a while. <laughs> um, the Africa Youth Movement, one of Africa's largest pan-African youth-led movements, and AFRAIST, a youth leadership program and multimedia platform documenting youth work in Africa. Aretha Brown is an Indigenous activist and artist who made headlines following her speeches at both the 2017 and 2018 Invasion Day protests in Melbourne. In 2017, Aretha was also elected the first female Prime Minister of the National Indigenous Youth Parliament. Mm -hmm. Aretha describes her activism and art as a means of giving herself a context in which to live. Aretha is also inspired by her home in Melbourne's western suburbs and her journey as a queer teenager. <laughs> my, my name is Madison Connaughton. I am the editor of the Saturday paper, um, but today I am the moderator of this panel, which is a huge privilege, um, and I'm really happy to be here. Just a tiny bit of housekeeping to start. There are two microphones down the front here. <laughs> um, at the end, we'll have about 20 minutes of questions, so if you, if you have a question, I'll let you know and make your way to the microphones. I've been told by the stage manager, please lean into the microphones. They're not particularly strong. Um, so you'll need to say your question quite loudly. Um, I guess to start, the name of this panel is kind of interesting. And Aretha, you were speaking about this a little bit before, the future of feminism. Maybe it has like a sense that feminism has a way to go. There, there are things that can change and, and be better um, and improve. Mm. But I wonder, like, what was your way into feminism? Like, what were your early experiences of it? How did you come to see yourself as a feminist or understand that in the world? Yeah, um, so I've said this before, but I didn't really ever get the privilege of deciding to be interested in politics. Um, being an Indigenous person in this country, I'm always seen as a political entity, no matter what I do, you know. Um, and that's really tricky, you know, so I didn't really get to decide. Um, and I guess, you know, <laughs> I just, I didn't, I didn't get to decide, you know. Um, and I, I guess the reason that I got into activism was because of my grandma, you know. Um, so she's Arnie Janice Brown and she lives out in Blacktown here um, in Sydney's western suburbs. But when she was my age, so 18, um, she was taken away from her mob, my mob, um, uh, in Nambaka Heads, which is a small community up in northern New South Wales, and she was brought to Sydney. And she was made to become... She was a housemaid for this dentist in Bondi. Um, and this isn't distant history, you know? This isn't stuff that we get to excuse ourselves from. This is stuff that's happening in this town um, with people that are still alive, you know? Um, when we talk about the future of feminism, I think it's important to acknowledge that it's our past that inevitably shapes the present, which will go on to shape our future, you know? So I think it's all about looking backwards to understand what's going to happen in the future and understanding patterns and... Um, yeah, you know? Um, but I guess I speak because she didn't get to speak, you know? Um, when she was forced to move here, she couldn't learn her language anymore. She wasn't allowed to celebrate her culture. It was all totally just... Um, Vanquished. She, she wasn't allowed to do any of it, and that affects me because now I can't learn it, you know? Mm. And it's so easy to just feel so um, 
there's just I just haven't got a context, you know. Um, I try to look back in history, but I don't see myself reflected back anywhere. Like <laughs> anywhere, you know. Um, I just finished Year 12 last year, and to just you know to finish Year 12 is hard, but to finish Year 12 being an Indigenous kid where you're not reflected in the curriculum that you're trying so hard to learn, it's just you know, it's just it's it's a big thing, you know. Um, you know, I did history in Year 12, and I get warranted the first two pages of the history book, and there's some you know dark skin fella with a boomerang. And then the next 200 pages, it's colonial history. And it's almost as like I didn't actually get a... I didn't actually exist before colonization, you know? My narrative only really exists once it was influenced... Once I, I somehow influenced, you know, white fellas, you know? Um, I just didn't exist before that, apparently. And when you have no history, I have no um, concrete kind of base to know anything about myself. I think that idea of school is interesting as well. Do you feel like... Um, growing up, like Aisha, I liked that school taught you about these things. Like, it, was it in your education to understand feminism or understand activism or how it was inherently political? No, it wasn't part of my schooling education at all. Um, I grew up in a place um, in England uh, called Southampton, uh, which is just outside of London. And it wasn't a very diverse place. You know, I was one of... Um, one of two black people in my entire school throughout the whole time, pretty much. Um, and, yeah, we never learned anything about, you know, as far as we knew, and we didn't even go into that, we just kind of understood, um, we knew the slave trade happened. It wasn't a very extensive um, understanding of it. I think it was just kind of skipped over, but we never, we didn't learn very much about any of that. Our, our history was very um, Eurocentric. Um, and I think, for me, I think, I think it was music, actually, when I was a young person. Like, that's where, and it's in rap music, in fact. It was rap music, the type of rap music that I was interested in at the time. People like Tupac, when I was eight, um, that were speaking about certain issues. Like, for me, that was maybe, like, the first, first political person that I saw. Um, and because I was, such a, I was at such a young age, um, listening to this type of stuff, um, that was maybe my first insight into the world not being quite what I think, especially as he spoke about race a lot and things like that. But it wasn't ever something that was part of my, my schooling education. And I think I could, I could probably say that for, for most um, people of colour growing up in, in England. That's not something we, have, we learn in school. That's something we have to seek for ourselves. And seeking from sort of US made? Yeah, yeah. So I guess um, in terms of a lot of um, black history, I guess... Um, the African-American experience is probably um, the one that people know most about, the one that has a lot of literature on it. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it was people like, whether it be Angela Davis or whether it be Maya Angelou's story or Malcolm X, um, James Baldwin, it was people like that where I kind of got to understand more about what happened historically and about my identity. Because although I'm not African-American, um, there are parallels, you know? There are very many parallels that you can relate to. Mm -hmm. Um, I when you sort of first came to prominence um, was during the Arab Spring in 2011. What point were you at in your life when you started blogging about the things? Is blogging, do people use the word blogging anymore? When you started writing and publishing online mm -hmm. about um, the things that you were seeing mm -hmm. and experiencing and, and um, seeing change in the yeah. world around you? Yeah, I started blogging out of frustration of mainstream media um, depiction and narrative of our movement. Uh, so people call it uh, the Arab Spring. How many people know about the Arab Spring? Okay. The Arab Awakening, you know, as if we were sleeping, we just woke up one day, <laughs> did the revolution. The Jasmine Revolution, you know, people died for dignity and they call it Jasmine. Um, so out of frustration, I was trying to tell the media that the Arab Spring is a Western narrative. We call it the revolution of dignity. Uh, that's what it is. And it is our right to own our own narrative. So blogging for me was more of owning my own voice uh, and my own narrative and with the mindset of realizing that uh, online and the digital space is an exclusive space. Uh, it's not uh, an open, you know, uh, uh, inclusive space, so I had the responsibility <clears throat> that I have uh, to be online to tell that story uh, to a global audience. 
Um, coming into feminism, I think for me, I have always been in my family uh, sort of radical uh, and a rebel uh, mm. around, and when I say radical, it doesn't mean I'm extremist, but mm. it means being my badass full self. <laughs> um, so being radical of just like saying, no, I'm not, I'm going to wear this, I'm not going to wear this. I come from a very uh, religious family. All my mother and father's family are veiled. I'm the only non-veiled, and I'm like, this is how I'm going to live, or getting out of my parents' house, or even traveling, which is not very common in, in the family. So just being radical in like growing up and doing things differently from what it's supposed to be as a, a girl. Um, when, I, when the revolution started, I found myself ready to politicize that voice. So my radical me uh, standing up in front of the elders in the family and saying no to things became that radical voice, political voice, standing up in front of police brutality and dictatorship and saying no, we want to live with dignity and enough is enough. Um, so that's how it became more of advocacy work, then it became more of activism. But I think when you go through like daily resistance and struggle growing up, it matures to a point where you can use that voice to, uh, to make change in your own country or community. I don't want to skip ahead too much, but the Tunisia is also often seen as um, a success story yeah. within that period of time. Do you think, looking at the past eight years, um, that, that the revolution has had a marked Im Im impact mm. or improvement in people's lives, and I guess maybe looking at women in particular. Yeah. I was talking in the previous panel about how I get really frustrated also with like international ranking of what democracy is in our part of the world by saying if election were peaceful or violent, you know, and that's like ranking democracy or defining if a country is democratic, and it really overlooks, and, and this is the way we also kind of judge revolutions, like we say, like all the headlines are about the failure of Egyptian revolution and things like that. And it, it really overlooks the underground cultural revolution that is happening in the process, because to arrive at that revolution, if it's you know, political or regime change, there is a lot of organizing. And in organizing, there is a lot of learning. <laughs> there is a lot of confrontation and battles that we have to take every day. And so even though we did not or might not have achieved the economic, you know, because it was a revolution for dignity and for livelihood and for jobs with dignity, um, and even though our economic situation didn't improve, um, we still have now dignity to speak freely, uh, dignity to act, dignity to citizen action. And I see the same also, I mean, we were taken as a model, but I see the same also in Egypt, where women have gained you know, Nubian rights in the constitution, when women have uh, started mobile application on sexual harassment and, dec and decreased the sexual harassment rate and things like that. So I think we whatever, you know, people every single year of the revolution, media comes to ask me, okay, four years of Tunisia's revolution, five years anniversary, eight years, and they like to say what happened bad, what went wrong, you know? But it's like, so many beautiful things happened. We won the Nobel Peace Prize, for God's sake, you know? <laughs> um, so I think it's just about how we define success or failure of um, a nation or of our progressive... Uh, um, uh, gains, and one of the most uh, gains, I think, of Tunisia's revolution is our constitution. We have rewritten a constitution from scratch for three years, and that was a daily exercise between Islamists and secularists of what should be in that constitution. And that was the role that we played as youth, as civil society, as feminists, to make sure that our progressive ideas are in there. I think that there's this... <laughs> Um, I think there's this idea that there's like an intergenerational divide that we're seeing in feminism at the moment. Um, and sometimes that comes in the form of like a critique, like young feminists don't do this, don't march, don't, you know, take a certain action in their feminism. Um, 
But I guess I'm curious to know what you think defines feminism in the current context. What do you think makes it different than perhaps previous generations? I can, I can pick yeah. up on that. Um, well, first of all, we are the most youthful generation of human history, like global youth, you know, we're the youngest in history. And in Africa, we are the most youthful population in the world. 65% uh, of Africa is under 30. So while the average, so we have a huge generational divide that you're talking about. The average age of African leadership is 66 years old, and the average age of the population is 25. So we have 45, 44 almost generation gap. And that is a gap of understanding the problem, and that is a gap of dealing with it. Um, I think in terms of like feminists, because I am part, or we are all part of the youth movement and feminist movement, and I think part of uh, this uh, generational divide is not understanding 21st century challenges uh, and not being able to speak about it. And that is also about... Um, some of us as well need to recognize that, yes, like we recognize the struggle, and without you, the previous generation, we wouldn't exist. You paved the way for many of us to be in leadership, to be in certain dom you know, fields and, and things like that. But we also have our own battle now, and we need you to support us. So the generation gap for me is more that the, 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 the previous generation is trying to like, give us a torch to continue something, but we are asking for co-leadership, like we need to collaborate right now. We don't want to inherit systems that we didn't co-design. We need to collaborate right now and co-lead so when we are in, in, in that space, uh, we can do a better job than you, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I feel like it's kind of what you were saying before, Aretha, like you're not the future, you're the present. Mm. Um, and that the idea of being the future of feminism is the work you're doing now. <laughs> um, yeah. Not having an impact. Just um, I guess, I, for me, like with the whole inter, you know, intergenerational thing, um, being a youth activist, um, it almost feels like a... I don't know, like I'm not being loyal to my mom if I weren't to bring my elders with me, you know? At the end of the day, um, I think it's incredible that I have a youth culture that I'm a part of here in Australia. But like I said, unless I'm bringing my nan to it, nan into it and my elders, which is just so intrinsic in Indigenous culture, then it just seems redundant to me. Um, I, I don't know. I, at the end of the day, in, you know, for a lot of in, within Indigenous activism, we kind of want the same stuff. You know, we we still want treaty, we still want land rights, we still want equal recognition, we still want equality. But what's changing is non-Indigenous perception of it, you know? Um, indigenous activists like Gary Foley and, um, you know, William Cooper, you know, we, like I said, we're finding the same things, but what's changing is our audience, you know? And I think, for me, it's incorporating technologies within that, you know? Because um, I, I see this thing, so um, I think my activism is kind of taking these stories of my elders and making it palatable for younger audiences to understand, you know? Um, and that has been a big, kind of being the, I don't know, that thing in the middle, hopefully. Um, I, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it totally does. Do you feel like this is like the, the youth social media question that I've yeah, I, asked, I, I feel I like. knew it was going to come up. <laughs> but do you feel like that's a helpful space to engage in those conversations? Like, do you think there's depth to the conversations you have on Instagram or Twitter or...? Um, I think I use social media just because I don't see myself uh, represented anywhere else, so I kind of have to do it myself. Mm -hmm. um, I find that with a lot of white feminist kind of rhetoric, it's sometimes it goes along those lines of talking about body image and that kind of stuff, but I'm not even privileged enough to be able to even look at how people are represented, because I don't even get a lot of it to compare, you know? <laughs> I take what I get, and that sucks, you know? Why aren't I seen? Um, I feel like just yelling sometimes, and being like, ah! I'm not, I just, why aren't I here, you know? Um, at the end of the day, I think um, I use that presence because you might not like my politics, and you might not like what I say, but if I'm being seen, um, then that's kind of enough, you know? Um, at this point in time, I remember um, 
sorry, just to find a little thing, but coming out, I think it was the 2015, um, it was like the marriage equality vote in Ireland, right? So there was this crazy campaign, which I kind of based a lot of my activism around, which was called, it was called Call Your Nana. And it was this campaign, it was as simple, as simple as just getting young people to call their grandparents and just explain the marriage equality debate. And at the end of the day, like, everyone's nan wants to hear from you. Um, <laughs> give her a call, like, she's, she's, you know, she's there, she wants to hear from you. And to just explain it, just to break these big things down, you know, because being a young person, I'm so privileged that I get access to social media. I have, like, the world at my hands, you know? And to think that my nan didn't even get to go to school because she had to work for some white fella, it's like, why? It seems so wrong, you know? So it's this thing of including my grandma in these conversations, including my elders, and saying, okay, so this is what people think about this issue, and to break it down in a way that's obviously not... Um, um, you know what I mean? Just to break it down, I think, mm. is helpful. Um, Aisha, I follow you on Twitter, mm -hmm. and I enjoy your tweets because I feel like you still aim for 140 characters, even though oh. you have... <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but they're very, like, yeah, very to the point. Mm -hmm. But do you feel like that's a helpful place for you to have these conversations. I guess, I mean, that video like went viral, um, mm. which is kind of what people dream of happening. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> social content. Yeah, I, I didn't expect that at all. Um, and maybe that's why it went viral, because I think online there's this idea that, you know, progress or feminism is, is one way, you know? And I think maybe when we talk about intergenerational gaps and things. I think maybe what I see in a lot of the new youth spaces, I don't even know if I can just call it youth, but maybe just contemporary third wave feminism really seems to focus on what some people, older generations push back on, um, is this thing called choice feminism, you know, and this idea that um, feminism is anything a woman chooses to do. Um, and, you know, I don't necessarily um, I don't necessarily resonate with that model because I think if, if feminism is anything and everything, then it runs the risk of becoming nothing. Um, and so for me, I think um, Twitter is maybe good in terms of, and social media potentially is good in terms of being able to express yourself in terms of having debates or conversations, not so much. I think um, when people are aware that they are being watched, they perform. You know, um, because I think we're in this era now where, you know, everybody wants to be um, perceived as ultra progressive. And if you're not perceived as ultra progressive, then the, the pushback can be uh, quite severe. You know, we, whether that's cancel culture, whether that's being ridiculed or whether that's having someone um, quote your tweet and, and embarrass you and that go viral. Um, and so I think, you know, a lot of things happening in that space can sometimes feel um, quite performative. Um, so I think it's maybe just good for you expressing yourself, but in terms of conversation, no, but it may be good in terms of aligning yourself with certain communities and, and finding people who, who feel the same way that you do um, and being able to learn. I think it can be a great space for learning, um, but often I think we only make um, space for, for only a few ideas to, mm -hmm. to, to push through. I think, I think for me, just to agree with your point, um, I use social media to represent my culture because it's like, it's, it demystifies it so much, you know? At the moment, because we don't teach Indigenous history in schools and in our curriculums, people just don't know anything, right? And so when you don't know anything about a group of people, you assume, and you're left so mystified. I'm kind of just, like, stuck, frozen in time, and I'm not really seen in any kind of contemporary space. And so just to be seen on social media, it's like, wow, this is actually... Wow, Ruth is just, like, I don't know, in the bath, or, like... I don't know, <laughs> like, doing, hanging with friends. This isn't weird, oh my goodness, you know? Um, and I think it's just breaking down, like, kind of, like, uh, that kind of barrier, in a sense. Mm. Mm. Do you, oh. I would just add um, to, to what you said, that the way we use social media is for organizing. Um, so we, you know, instead of everyone going somewhere to protest, now you can bring everyone to one place to protest just by a Facebook event. Um, and when we started the, the revolution in Tunisia in 2011, I think we were the first to do that. We were the first to turn 
social media into a tool for social change, because then it's not just this place of chat and, um, you know, I remember in 2009, people used social media for, like, Facebook for dating and stalking <laughs> other family members. <laughs> um, but we, we created the first Facebook event and the first Facebook page that check facts what's happening and live stream things happening on the street. And, um, I mean, on the other hand, I don't want to exaggerate because some people turn it into analysis of like the Facebook revolution, the Twitter revolution, of course your live tweet revolution and so on. But without people on the ground, you can't do revolution. So um, it's also how you use it as a tool of organizing, coordinating. Uh, people I've met uh, in the protest, I knew online and we were organically coordinating, but I met them in the street and they're still my friends today. But at the same time, you cannot um, make change if you don't move offline. Mm -hmm. And there are many a great now hashtag, you know, movements that make you uh, make that diversity happen. Me too, and all these hashtags. But if you don't move that conversation to your grandmother and to my mother, and you know, to people who disagree uh, with what you're saying, then we cannot have a conversation at all. The the other aspect I wanted to touch on is that we need to be cautious that. We have a huge digital divide. So when we talk about, you know, conversations, social media or online and things like that, we need to remember half of the world is offline. This is a fact. This is statistics. 48% of the world is offline. Africa's population, 70% is offline. So if you really want to make um, concrete change in communities and shift conversations or organize and things like that, we need to be cautious of that, and we need to also work to close the digital divide, because I believe the future of feminism is digital. It's, we are the most connected generation, and we will continue to be. But if we will continue to be leaving all these people behind, because these 50% are the most marginalized. So when we say we own our voice, and we know we have conversation online, we represent people, owning your voice doesn't mean speaking on behalf of people. It means amplifying and elevating the voices of the most vulnerable, those who don't have access. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm curious if any of you feel a tension about participating in structures or organisations or brands or working for things that have been built by previous generations. I wonder, like, I know, Aretha, you do a lot of, like, work within the political system or you work with brands and, and music labels or within kind of NGOs. I, do you ever feel a tension about whether you can change those things from within? I guess it's that, do you work within or do you build something that is outside of that? Mm. Yeah, um, I... Yeah, it can be conflicting. <laughs> yeah, I work as a fashion stylist and, you know, it's not necessarily... Um, it's not necessarily the most political or social spaces, you know, and they're not necessarily the most aware spaces. Um, and so I don't necessarily, and you know, and especially at the moment, you have a lot of brands and companies who are co-opting a lot of these movements, you know, who are jumping on hashtags, who are appearing woke uh, for the sake of profit and things like that. And I think it can become dangerous in the sense that um, people feel that maybe um, ultimate liberation is to be able to see marginalized people in these spaces, mm. you know, and I'm not so sure a lot of the time. Um, so I think, I think, you know, for me, maybe I use, I use these things to get what I need from them um, and build within my own communities <laughs> and my own organizations, like whether that's funds or whatever, but it's not for me, the revolution isn't working with a brand. Mm. You know, it isn't, it's maybe being able to empower uh, minority communities and, mm. and people who don't have things to, to start our own. But it's not to, um, to sort of add more profit to those who are quite exploitative anyway. You know, whatever the current trend was, um, a, lot of these mo a lot of these brands are, are going to be willing to jump on anything. Um, so I think as long as we don't think of um, liberation as... Um, as solely representation within like these capitalist structures, you know, and these brands and organizations. Um, 
I think that, um, you know, we might have a chance in, in building more for ourselves, you know, but it's, it's not necessarily, for me at least, it's not, it's not within those structures. I, um, I agree with you because um, I feel as though to work, like, our, to be Indigenous in the country and to be successful and smart is to inevitably be really isolated, you know? I'm working within these systems at the moment, and when I was elected um, Indigenous Prime Minister, it was crazy because it's like, oh, man, like this is what I know success to be, but to my grandma, she's never liked, you know, to, the, to my grandma and to the mob, we've never liked government. And for me, it's about trying to really establish trust in these systems, you know, but it's really tricky. Um, not to be too flash again, but I actually had a piece of artwork in the NGV this month down in Melbourne, which is like the gallery there. And while that's really, it's, it's pretty cool that I get to do that, well, it's awesome, but it's crazy because it's also, I have this incredible cognitive dissonance all the time, because it's like, okay, so success, because I get my artwork there, but at the same time, I went to the NGV the other day, and we still, like, we still have levels in the NGV dedicated to race. That's whack. That's like mm. some get out shit. It's like <laughs> scary. No, it is. It's really whack. So I can go, and there's like the Chinese section, there's like the South Sea Islander section, there's the Europe, European section, which is always a lot bigger. <laughs> but I won't mention it. Um, <laughs> and then it, it's still categorized by race. And it's like, this is really weird. Why are we still doing this? This is the NGV. This is the most progressive art space we have in Australia. But I can just, you know, uh, I'm privileged in the fact that I can just ignore an entire culture of people by just not going to this one level. It's really weird, right? And so it's like, OK, what do you do? Because I don't want to buy into this thing. But I also want to better myself, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so it's like, oh. <laughs> but it's not until you realize how much race is intertwined in this country that you can actually do anything about it, you know? Because um, it's, it's everywhere, you know? Um, and it's, it's whack. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think for me, my mantra is occupy. Um, and this is since, <laughs> yeah, since I, I became fearless in the revolution and being on the front line is like breaking all your fears. I mean, what, would be, what could be worse than that? Um, and after eight years of activism on the ground, um, I'm a movement builder, so I worked a lot with organizing youth. I'm now transitioning to diplomacy, so... I was appointed just three months ago the Youth Envoy of the African Union, and that means being in rooms with a, a lot of old men, you know, mm. being the youngest, being the only female in the room. And I did that to show uh, African youth that you need to occupy leadership positions that you deserve, and we need to be there. And I wanted to inspire many African youth to do that, because that is the generational gap. If we will continue, letting old people, uh, old men, uh, you know, rule, um, then when are we going to serve, you know? Uh, we need to change. We need... And many, because I've seen also organizing youth throughout Africa, I've seen youth who become products of the system. So we're not really changing the, the leadership. Uh, we just continue to inherit the same system. So... For me, it was more of showing a different way of leadership, that you can be a young diplomat, you can still be cool, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and you can speak a simple language, and not complicated, and uh, you can serve, you know. Uh, so it's, um, it's challenging to be in the system, but it's uh, necessary to change our regimes, to change our continents, to advance our lives. I want to ask one last question, but um, we're just down to the last couple of minutes, so if you do have a question, please move um, to the microphones. We would love to hear your questions. Um, so I guess coming back to the future of feminism, to make this a really neat circular mm -hmm. panel, um, is there, if you could change or influence or redirect feminism towards kind of a better, more inclusive, more effective, more mm. active, whatever it, it looks like future. Like, what is the thing that you think needs to change within 
the structure of feminism? Mm. For me, the future of feminism has to be about transnational solidarity. Um, and that means that women politicians here make decisions that affect positively women's where I come from. And as of now, women politicians in Australia have been sending bombs to Syria and Yemen, and those bombs go firsthand on women and girls. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we are willing to advance the feminist agenda as a global agenda, then we, as women who claim in the political sphere to be feminists, need to be aware of our policies and action that affect women in other parts of the world. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, I would say that it's, um, we need to be able to, you know, I think when we live in these parts of the world, I think it's very easy to, to, to get caught up in, in, what's, in only what's happening with us, you know? And I think that we are quite privileged to be able to be in these spaces and to have these conversations and to be online because this isn't something that's accessible to so much of the world. And so I think to be able to amplify those voices um, that exist beyond what we call the West and to, to, yeah, to give a helping hand in, in many ways and to use our privilege um, yeah, to be of more benefit to, to people who don't have access, I think for me would be um, yeah, a way to go, you know, and like you're saying, to, to make this a lot more global. I think that's what we could do. Um, I think, honestly, it's, just, it's literally just asking why, you know, for me anyway. Um, the best advice my grandma ever gave me was that if you want to understand someone and understand truthfully what's hurting someone, then you have to ask why, because then you can never really be upset or angry with someone. You can just understand, you know? Why is this person like they are? Why is this person, why is this you know, man or, you know, or woman more confident in this space? Why is this person um, are like they are? You know, why is this group of people, Indigenous Australians, more likely to, you know, insert, you know? It's, it's asking why, you know, why aren't we taught Indigenous history? Who's in charge of it? And why aren't we being taught things? <laughs> it's very vague, but you have to... I encourage independent research more than anything, because if you want to learn truths about this country, you won't find it um, in the places where you think, you know? You have to go out and search for it yourself, because I'm doing it every single day. I'm at this standpoint right now because it's as though non-Indigenous Australians are trying to learn about me and I'm trying to unlearn things that have been taught about me, you know? So <laughs> it's like I'm trying to... I feel like I'm getting further and further away. And I think the only other thing I have, an advice, is just to be fearless if you're a young person um, and know that events like this are incredible, but um, even some of the sponsors, like Westpac, you know, since 2008, they've lent over $13 million to fossil fuel companies that actually kick indigenous mob and women and children off, you know, traditional lands. So it's also just understanding where power comes from, you know? I'll say it, too late! <laughs> I said it! Bye! <laughs> I already spoke, <laughs> you know? So. <laughs> I already said it, what are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> we got you. <laughs> um, well, maybe we can just keep that applause going. Can everyone please thank our panel? Um, I have incredibly bad eyesight at the best of times. I can't see if there's anyone... We have a question maybe at, at one? Yep, hi. Hi. Um, this is more of a comment than a question. Um, I think you're all amazing. Um, <laughs> and I am of a funny generation where we were the first kind of generation that had an iPhone. You know, I had my first iPhone when I was 25. Um, mm -hmm. And so I didn't really grow up in that you know, constantly being on the digital age. And, you know, I watch um, members of my family who are 18, 19 and who navigate this online space so much better than I do. 
I just came from a talk next door that had four politicians, you know, who are there and representing us. And the main advice they gave for women like me and, you know, women like my stepdaughter is that we have to be authentic and we have to be fearless. And they sat there and they were hypocritical and they lied. <laughs> and everything we asked them, they just talked around it and they were awful. And you guys sit here and, you know, you're so much younger than them, but you are so much more braver than them and fearless than them and you inspire me and give me hope. And I just think you're amazing. Go ahead. Because you've given us so much advice on the future of feminism, but I was wondering what's your advice to me as a young woman so that when I grow up, I can live amongst all the other people in my generation in a world where there's equality and there's like no sexism. What's your advice to me? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, the thing is, by the time that, you know, when you get older, you know, because, you know, change doesn't unfortunately happen as quick as we'd like it to. And so there might still be sexism and there might still be things like that happening. But it's just about, you know, we can't necessarily change other people, but we can change our response to other people. And we can change how we approach situations. And, and going off of what Aretha said about asking why, I think asking why is a really crucial thing because I think it's very easy to get angry and outrage, and you know, and anger and outrage is, is, is perfect. We need that to some degree. But I think in order to understand and to, to be able to attack things from the root instead of the branches, I think if we ask why um, and be curious, um, we, can, we can start to form groups and we can start to build our own personal armor so that we don't have to internalize these things that are, are told about us and these lies that we internalize constantly. So I think it's just about um, being, able to, being able to arm yourself and, and not necessarily letting anybody else's definition of you define you. Yeah. I would, I would just add to that that I definitely agree with you. Actually, the estimate is that gender equality will take another 108 years. Mm -hmm. Politicians don't act now. Yeah. Um, but what I would say, which is great about social media, thank you for mentioning that, is that social media is taking all the masks of people as well down uh, because people are, they're, you know, um, they make a lot of, um, they're hypocrite, but they still have their truthful self out there. And that's what I would tell you, to be your radical, badass self every single day, you know, and not be apologetic about that. And while you continue to be confident in yourself and continue to exist in your full freedom, uplift other women with you, because that is the problem. What we can promise, I think, is to open the door for other women, and probably what these politicians are not doing when they talk about diversity, but they're not opening the door for other women to come in and represent, you know? We don't, we're not asking you even to advance the gender agenda if you don't want to, but let other people come in in their diverse so we can have an inclusive table. Um, so uplift other women as brave as you as well when you do that. Maybe we can get one from two. <laughs> um. Hello, thank you so much. It's been like incredible listening to you and I'll keep this brief. It's a bit cheesy, but I love hearing about uh, the people that inspire you and I was just wondering if you guys could maybe um, talk a little bit more to the people that you look towards um, and maybe hope to embody in, in your activism and your work. I know that you guys have actually spoken about them already, but mm -hmm. if you could talk about it more, I would love that. Oh. And any readings or suggestions of yeah. readings or things that... Mm. Yeah, I would say, uh, from my part of the world, the Egyptian Nawel Sadawi. Um, I mentioned in the other panel, she, she says amazing things that gives me fire, you know? And she's like, there is no revolution without women, there is no democracy mm. without women. Um, and when she was asked that you're, you're, uh, you're savage and dangerous, 
She said, well, I'm saying the truth, and the truth is savage and dangerous. Um, so uh, I would highly recommend an Egyptian Noel Sadawi. Mm. Um, I really like women who... Um, I really like women who, who really um, differ from, let's say, um, everything that we're taught about what women should be. You know, women who are really intellectual. I really like a woman called Susan Sontag. I think Susan Sontag is very interesting. I really like her critique. I really think that she's just very committed to her intellect. And I think um, as women, you know, I don't think our, our minds are in, uh, empowered enough. You know, I think especially in this new era of third wave feminism, I think a lot of things are, are focused on our outward you know, looks and, you know, and our bodies. And although those things are important, I think more than anything, um, more, than, more than beauty and looks could ever give you confidence, you know, what's in your mind will, more so, will take you there. So I really like Susan Sontag. And apart from her, someone who's really changing a lot of the, the narratives and what we think about Nigeria, which is a place where I'm from and my parents, is, is Chimamanda, uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. I really appreciate her. And I really think that she is... Um, she's just, she's very Nigerian, uh, and I really like that. And, and being very Nigerian is being a little bit bold, and it's being a bit of maybe what some people can call arrogant sometimes, but I love that no matter what space she's in, whether, no ma yeah, what, whatever space she's in, she's herself, she comes in her Nigerian attire, she, she just really tells a different story, and, and she encourages every woman to tell their story. Um, so, yeah. I recommend her TED Talk, the yeah. single story, yeah. Yeah, that was a good one. Um, I, I think I already mentioned before, but it's just hands down my grandma, you know, and the elders of my community. Mm -hmm. um, she is probably the most intelligent and the most beautiful and the most hardworking person I've ever met, but we just don't get to hear her stories, and it's your loss, not mine, you know? Mm -hmm. um, we need to search for these stories, because at the end of the day, um, I'm only 18 years old, I'm just working it out, and... What I'm saying isn't remarkable. I'm just talking about my experiences going to high school, you know? And I think it just reflects back how incredibly Eurocentric um, and wide our media and narratives are when me just talking about going to school becomes this incredible thing. Um, I, like I said, it's my grandma, um, you know? It's just this wealth of knowledge, but we, we just don't get to see it, you know? Um, just to go back to what you were saying before, um, in terms of like where your activism started, I just remembered, I think, mine. Um, the first, it's just my little story, but the first time I ever saw an Aboriginal person on TV, um, it was when they had Rage. Rage used to play on like a um, Saturday night, like I late at night or something. Still, I think it's still on. Oh, I think it's yeah. just Saturday mornings, but you, this one was on every night, late at night. Um, and I saw this Aboriginal woman on David Bowie's Let's Dance video clip, <laughs> and I kid you not, I, I cried. I was like, oh man, like, I know how beautiful Aboriginal people are. I know how intelligent and complex and diverse we are. And David Bowie sees it. <laughs> no one else does, but he gets it. I was like, man, if David Bowie, like, David Bowie could have anyone in the entire world up there dancing with him, he chose us. And I was like, he gets it. I can do anything after that, you know? And that one little instance stu like, stood with me because it was so remarkable, you know? Ask yourself why there are, you know, why are there more Indigenous people in the spaces that you're working with? They're both creative you know, just everything, you know? Um, why aren't we reaching out for these things and who holds the power and the key to unlocking them, you know? Um, and just from my advice from before from my mate who asked, um, I haven't got like a set piece of advice because like I said, I'm just working it out, you know? Um, but it'd probably be just call your nan, <laughs> call your nan, uh, do your independent research and change your bank. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and what, and what? Change your bank. Ah. Change your bank. Because at, at, the, end, at the end of the day, um, like I said, if you ask why quite a lot and you work out, you know, who's in charge of all these things, you quite often find it's the same kind of culprits. So mm -hmm. just, you know, ask you those things and um, just a really piece of practical advice to any young women out there. Um, write a letter to your local PM. It sounds really stupid, but this is a cool fact. I only learned this the other day, but if you write um, a letter to your local PM and you put your age and whatever you want to talk about, they actually count it as being the ideas of 20 people, young people around you, but they count it as like, the, yeah, the ideas of 20 p young people around you, but they just 
uh, say that like they, those people haven't like gone to the effort of writing the letter, but they just assume that. So when they eventually go to do policies and polls, your one letter counts for 20 people, you know. So write a letter. It's really silly, like uh, really simple, but it's worth it. So yeah. <laughs> clear it up. That's the final thing. Um, maybe from number two. <laughs> Hi, nice to meet you guys. Because um, today our topic is about the future of feminism, but I can help to notice that there are few, or maybe nearly no male in this room. <laughs> so, uh, but I think that about the future of feminism, it is important for male and female to all participate in this action. So I want to ask, uh, are there any like advice from you guys to tell to the male, to let them to participate in the future of feminism more effectively. I can see a couple of men. Right here. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, for me, my father is a feminist without knowing it, because um, not because he advocated and fought for my right, but because he allowed me to exist the way I want. So when I stood up, in many occasions in the family, he, because of the structure that he's the head of the family, you know, and respect among um, extended family, um, when I was brave to do these things, he backed me up and he just um, allowed me to take my own choice, even disagreeing with it, and he didn't agree on many choices I made in my study and in my career, but he just respected that. And I think that's what we're asking a lot of men to do. It's not about, you know, uh, of course we need the political world a lot to, to reach gender equality, but sometimes it's just about respecting women lived experiences and struggles and just supporting that, you know, amplifying that, uh, backing, backing that uh, up. And the other thing I think is um, we forget always when we talk especially about gender-based violence that um, we focus on the victim, you know, and we don't focus on the perpetrator. Um, and if we do not start making the next generation conscious about how the structure of violence, uh, economic, political, you know, physical, psychological, is done, then our boys will always grow up with a certain understanding of what women's role in society is and how women should be subjected to certain practices. And obviously, men have, um, are also socially constructed in a way that they don't show their emotions and their femininity and leadership and things like that. And these are always conversations that should happen with both sexes, not just with women. So I think it's, um, it's just about having an inclusive conversation because I know that even in my part of the world, men feel excluded from the feminist conversation. Um, but I think feminism, again, is about um, equality for everyone. And still today, 2019, a lot of men think that women, feminist women hate men, and feminist women would make men cook for them, and, <laughs> you know, they, you know, they're single. <laughs> and, like, and, like, they stay single for life, and, you know, all these stereotypes about being feminist, but it's like, it's about our skill set. If you're the one who knows how to cook, yeah, you better cook because I'm not going to eat bad food. But, <laughs> um, but I think, you know, it, it's that. It's, it's, um, it's that understanding that feminism is about women liberation, is about uh, freedom, is about equal rights, equal opportunities from the understanding that that will make the world a better place, you know? Not because one or the other, it's just, uh, that's what we want to all heed towards, a world that is a better place. And if you have, women have access to education, it's not just to make them smart, but that these women will grow up and become influential in their own spaces and will contribute to society. So let's value femininity as we value masculinity and let's all work towards gender equality. Yeah, um, I, I think when, you know, I think it's a, a good question and I think that um, the future of feminism should definitely um, be more inclusive of men. And I think a lot of people's feminism is. I think sometimes the issue is that 
a lot of men see that a female empowerment being a denial of mm -hmm. male, you know, male rights. And I think men um, and women need to understand that, you know, feminism is to liberate boys as well and to liberate men. And it's to remind them that, you know, because men are, are living under this, you know, are trapped under the burden of patriarchy too. You know, it's not healthy for any of us. And, you know, you know, in terms of men not being able to feel like they can cry or not being able to show their emotions and not being able to do these things, patriarchy almost um, devoids you of being human. You know, it's kind of taking away that right. And so I think when we allow ourselves to be authentic, because men do cry, men do have emotions, and men do feel. And to allow yourself these things is to have a rich existence in life, um, because riches isn't only money. Um, and so I think... Um, when we start to understand that, you know, feminism isn't to deny men's rights, but is to kind mm -hmm. of push for human rights, I think that we can work harmoniously together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, no, but I, I don't want to jump in, but I think what um, you're saying is kind of stopping this zero-sum game, kind of thinking about about the world, like I, just on Friday, our Prime Minister speaking on International Women's Day, I'm sure this has come up a lot today, but it's, we want women to succeed, but not at the expense of oh. other people. Oh, <laughs> and, it's just, and it's just this typical, and it's this typical fragile, like, and we have to actually, yes, I can roll my eyes in it and I can, uh, but at the same time, it's really sad. It's, you know, but no, if you really think about it, it's really sad that like men, we've allowed men to get to a point where like, their ego and, and masculinity can be so threatened but by, by thinking that a woman wanting equal rights or a woman wanting to be treated as human or a woman mm. wanting dignity is to take something away from them. Mm. This is almost a mental illness, mm -hmm. you know? It is. You have a very insecure prime minister. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> on Women's Day! <laughs> I like having story. been here for a few days, you have already summed <laughs> oh him up gosh. spectacularly. <laughs> um, I can't believe you can say that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> Very insecure. Um, yeah, but I, I, I don't know, I do think that, that it's, it's a way of thinking about the world that it's almost that women want to take revenge through feminism. Yeah. And it's, that's so incredibly narcissistic. Right. That is not what is I happening. Would, yeah, <laughs> I think, I think the, the other thing is that many people think that this part of the world would be the most progressive on women's rights. Mm -hmm. when, when, when Rwanda has 60% of its parliament women, mm -hmm. you know, when we had almost six or seven women presidents and the United States cannot even accept to have a female president in the mm. last election. Like it doesn't, you know, comprehend it. So I think as much as this is again how we measure progressive societies or progressive leadership, there is a crisis of values in global leadership. And being in Africa now is so exciting for me because all I see is progress, progress, progress. Like we're hitting all the laws, we're getting there, we're debating equal inheritance in Tunisia as we speak, you know? It's the first in the region if, if we pass that law. Uh, we're talking about Africa's integration, free movement, you know, visas, you know, mm. like progressive policy going just on. And I look at the other part of the room like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> um, so, Again, to transnational solidarity, I think there is a lot of learning that the global north can take from the global south because we've been through a lot of repression and oppressive things. And if there is a backlash in this society, we can support and we can help how to deal with it as well. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, that is all the time we have. Can you please join me in thanking our panel, Ayesha Blue, Aisha Kandi, and Aretha Brown. <laughs>